All right, peeps. We got the one and only Matt McManus back in the house today to unpack his latest book on Michael Brooks and cosmopolitan socialism. And boy, oh boy, did I enjoy this one. McManus is by far one of my favorite writers and budding public intellectuals today. Like many people, I first came across his writing back in 2018, roughly, and I was immediately taken by his acute analysis and theorizing on the rise of the new right, or what he likes to call postmodern conservatism. But after digging into his PhD work and reading his first book on human dignity and discovering that he was taking a developmental and capability-based approach to human dignity like Michael Brooks, Martha Nosenbaum, and Gergen Habermas, I was immediately hooked on his work and have been following him ever since. In any event, I hope you all enjoy our conversation. Like usual, make sure to check out the links and references for fruit of the reading. Cheers. All right, Matt, how does it feel? Cosmopolitan Socialism is out in the world. Your book on Michael Brooks. Yeah, it feels pretty good, man, honestly. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for having me back. It's always good to talk with you. Um, And yeah, I should say I've been working on this book now since the beginning of the pandemic, actually. Uh, I'll never forget Doug Lane from Zero Books, uh, back when he was still at Zero Books, called me up and was like, hey, do you want to do something on cosmopolitan socialism? Tragically, Michael had just died. And I was really actually overwhelmed by the prospect of doing that precisely because so much had happened. Uh, and because, you know, who wants to follow in such a giant's footsteps? Uh, but, you know, after a little deliberation, I decided to say yes. And it took me about a year or so, I'd say, uh, to read over a lot of the stuff that Michael had produced on this, to listen to his, to his programs, to do my own research. Uh, and I'm just happy the book is finally out there. It's been a long journey. Uh one pandemic and another international move uh, to get to this release. So super excited. Oh, no way. I, did, I didn't even know a bit of the backstory between you and Lane in terms of uh, drafting up this uh, this this particular book. No, just saying, Doug, you know, he was really enthusiastic about it. He thought that it'd be a good compliment to what Michael was doing. And, you know, I've got to say, Doug was really keen to uphold Michael's legacy uh, since they had always talked about writing another book together on cosmopolitan socialism uh, and you know, again, it was super intimidating to be asked to do that. Uh, so intimidating. That's one of the reasons I asked Ben Burgess uh, to get in and write the introduction, uh, t- just to kind of uh, give me an, an assist to make sure I didn't fuck up too hard in any meaningful way. But oh. I'm pretty happy with the result. Oh, yeah, for sure. No, I mean, I, I guess because I was just getting the dates kind of confused. I thought that Lane had already left Zero Books and Zero Books had been sold off and that kind of whole hoopla around with repeater books and stuff like that. I thought you had the... Uh, put that in after after that i didn't realize that w- that, that went in beforehand cool um oh no this book has been a, a long time coming in part because there was uh, quite a bit of drama backstage about this uh but i have to say the new people at zero have also been very supportive of the text you know email me super excited about this so uh, i've been very lucky to have a lot of backers uh who've kind of been cheerleaders for the text which is nice Beautiful. No, no, for sure. Yeah. And I was obviously very touched with uh, Burgess's sort of introduction as well. And I was also super touched as well by um, your talk that you guys recently did as well. um, In terms of the release, I listened, I had time to actually listen to that. So I was quite uh, uh, touched and moved. And it's always interesting to me, uh, kind of listening to you guys, uh, in terms of Michael's life, uh, because I'm I'm coming at this completely from a different vantage point, uh, you know. Like I grew out out of the sort so-called integral movement that Michael right. was kind of involved in or been influenced by in his earlier years. And uh, actually, I've actually befriended one of his good friends, Josh Summers, who actually the the co-author of his first book. And we've actually become since very good friends since I actually interviewed him on my pod. And oh, cool. uh, it's been great to kind of connect with him and here as well, kind of like his roots and his family life that he had and stuff like that. But also in terms of, you know, the various things that they were both involved in that eventually led up to the book uh, in terms of the, uh, the the Buddha's playbook that they eventually wrote, the book on meditation and stuff like that. And uh, actually, Josh is actually going to be releasing uh, an interview with um, and Joseph Goldstein. I don't know if you know who Joseph Goldstein is. No, I don't think so. 
He's actually the founder of IMS, the Insight Meditation Society up in Bear, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, where Michael and Josh actually met and stuff like that. But the funny thing is, is that uh, Joseph Goldstein was actually Sam Harris's uh, meditation teacher for years. So there's some interesting sort of uh, uh, back and forth as well that Michael had with Josh and some people around IMS around uh, Sam Harris. So it's kind of a, a bit of an inside dig, right, in terms of how he uh, he was actually able and quite skillful at actually going out and debunking Sam Harris as well in his book and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, actually, <laughs> that explains a lot because I was always wondering why Sam Harris occupied such a prominent part uh, of his book against the web, right? Uh, on the intellectual dark web. Uh, and maybe I don't know, he just had knew something that all the rest of us didn't about what a jerk he was and felt that he needed to settle the score some way, <laughs> shape or form. Uh, but I think the more, the thing that really sticks out to me about that story though, is again, just what a diverse array of interests Michael had, right? Uh, that actually came through in the interview, the last interview, uh, we listened to, um, for the stuff I did with Ben's show, where it was talking about integral theory, spirituality, had the picture of Lula in the background, uh, was talking about cosmopolitan socialism and how much it mattered to him, right? Uh, Michael was one of those people who just had an extraordinarily expansive curiosity uh, about humanity, uh, about spirituality, about politics, about everything, right? And I think that's what people really connected to, uh, in a way. In a world where there are a million and a half political pundits, uh, the fact that he brought not just a unique personality, but a new gravity uh, to everything that he did was really special. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and not only that, I mean, just the, his ability to go and connect with so many different people across the political spectrum and, and people in his entourage. And I mean, he was just so charismatic in terms of a character that, I mean, it's and obviously funny. I mean, it's just be funny out of this world i mean i could listen to you know his his interpretations and his his comedic stuff i mean i think he could have just been actually just a, a stand-up comedian as well but i mean just so intelligent to be able to go and do amazing political commentary as well and stuff like that oh definitely right uh i mean he and i used to message on twitter uh every now and then right i'm really sad that we never did more together although you know we floated the idea. Uh, but the one interaction that I had with him that was pretty lengthy was the interview I did for Zero Books, actually just very shortly before he died. And Michael was exactly the way you described, right? He was really warm. He was really affable. Uh, and not only that, he really seemed to care about me, right, as a person. Uh, he wasn't one of those people who was just like, yeah, 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 let's get on with the interview. Like, you know, give me your questions and I'll answer them and then I'll leave. He was like, how are you doing? What are your thoughts? You know, what do you think about this idea? You know, let's dialogue about it, right? Uh, which is an extraordinarily rare thing. And it was something that really touched me uh, at the time, uh, especially because, you know, I was going through a rough, rough period myself, you know, pandemic. We moved to Mexico. I was living with my brother, which was very nice of him, right? So, I don't know. He was just one of those guys who radiated a certain kind of empathy uh, that was incomparable uh, in a lot of ways. And the left has really never quite recovered from the shock of his loss. Oh, no, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, in, in how he launched so many people's careers is amazing yeah. as well. You're right. I mean, in terms of helping people out, giving them either their first jobs or, I mean, even when I interviewed Ben, I mean, I was so touched in terms of, you know, like how that connection essentially opened up so many avenues for him as well in terms of publishing his books and his connection to Jacobin and obviously, you know, and all the, the other friendships that developed because of Michael and stuff like that. Um, and I mean, I wish he was still here. Uh, to actually go out and really get into it with you specifically. I mean, because if, I mean, I love both of your writing and I came to Michael quite late, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. compared to some other people that were, you know, around sort of the uh, the integral movement and stuff like that, or people that are involved in terms of uh, American Buddhism and uh, interest in the, the sort of mindfulness meditation sort of uh, crew and stuff like that all across the United States and North America, and obviously in all in Europe as well. Um, and I mean, obviously he, he got to you as well. I mean, this is because um, on the idea of the, uh, the capabilities approach or taking a, a, a human development mm -hmm. approach uh, that basically that he draw, he drew out of, or he was obviously quite influenced in terms of Mar Marcia Sand. And I'm not too sure if actually he read Martha Nosenbaum and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. that's kind of one of the first things that you zero in on in terms of your book. And I'd love to kind of, 
because uh, this is the other thing too, is, I mean, as you're kind of, you, your profile has kind of grown as well. And you're, you've kind of, I guess, kind of known now as this critic of conservatism or even a scholar of conservatism, but that's, that's not awesome. really, that's not your, your roots, right? Your background is actually in uh, critical legal studies and your yeah, first yeah. book that you wrote specifically, which I, you know, once I start to get, you know, a bit of a grasp of your writing and, and how you were influenced by Amartya Sen and the whole capabilities uh, based approach or a human development based approach. I was like, I need to get into this guy's work. So I guess maybe, um, and maybe you can talk just a bit about that aspect of the book, uh, because it doesn't get fleshed out in a lot of the other conversations that you have. And it's not exactly um, a subject of conversation amongst your more sort of socialist and Marxist uh, circles that you bounce around in quite a bit. So I wonder if maybe you can kind of flesh it about and kind of how it's influenced you a bit. Sure. Well, you know, man, it's really touching to hear you say that, actually, because you're right, you know, um, to the extent people want to talk to me about any of the stuff that I've done, it's almost always the political right, postmodern conservatism, uh, reactionary politics. And that's fine. You know, I'm very happy to talk about those things. Uh, and, you know, I've spent a lot of time writing about them because I am concerned about that. And I am interested in them. Right. Uh, but, you know, my early interest was in leftist theory, right, which I think sometimes people forget, uh, which is actually why I'm also excited about the new book I'm writing on liberal socialism, because it's almost like a return to roots uh, for me. Uh, but some of the first leftist theorists that were interested in uh, were people like Amartya Sen uh, or Cornel West or Roberto Unger. Uh, and a lot of those interests, I should say, overlapped with Michael, right, uh, particularly the Sen and West connection. Uh, and what really appealed to me about Amartya Sen was two things, right? Uh, first off, Amartya Sen was extraordinarily ecumenical in the array of interest that he was willing to acknowledge and take seriously. Uh, and I mean, this is a man whose erudition uh, was vast and global global in its scope, right? Uh, so you'd hear him reference the Upanishads one day and then Indian history another, and then talk about, uh, you know, classical political economy versus neoclassical political economy, since he was trained as an economist, and then, you know, riff on John Rawls, uh, but also take Adam Smith and Karl Marx very seriously. So that kind of epumenical approach to world thought, really, was something that I was very inspired by, uh, and the interdisciplinary power of his integrations uh, and their grace, because uh, Sen is a very graceful writer, right, where he'll put forward what seems like a pretty simple idea, like this capabilities approach that has a lot of depth to it, right? Uh, but when you think about it at first hand, it seems so uh, transparent and obvious, right? And it's very easy to kind of grasp the contours of. And I guess the second thing uh, that really impressed me about it was the substance uh, of Sen's argument that when it comes time to ask what do we want uh, to do in order, what do we need to provide people with, excuse me, in order to lead a good life? That according to Sen, at least, there's been a major mistake made by many analytical philosophers because analytical philosophers like Rawls or Dworkin tend to emphasize the fact that what people want are resources, right? Um, so, you know, if I have a car or I have a house or I have a television, uh, this will enable me to lead a better life than I could lead if I didn't have them, right? Now, Sen is obviously sympathetic to this argument. It's not like he's knocking resources, but he says really what makes resources useful uh, isn't resources in themselves uh, so much as what it is that I can do with these resources, right? Uh, so I want a car not because I necessarily want to drive a car, although some people do want to do that, uh, but because it allows me to transport myself around more easily. And that allows me to do other things that I might not be able to do. Uh, and from these very simple sets of insights, uh, he derives this capabilities approach, right? That what's more important than asking, what do people need in order to secure a good life? We need to ask, how do we make people capable uh, of leading a good life? And this entails asking, yes, what resources do we need to give them? But also, how can we structure social relations and social institutions to enable them to become more capable, right? And this opens up a whole array uh, of different ways of looking at social problems related to egalitarian justice uh, that I really think weren't clear before people like Sen and Nussbaum got into the field. Got it. I mean, and, well, I mean, because this is the interesting thing is that kind of like Michael, um, after, I mean, leaving the sort of stomping ground of humanistic psychology, transpersonal psychology, that eventually became the integral movement and stuff like that. 
uh, there's a big core within that because of psychology that within those particular circles that has been inspired or influenced by uh, developmental psychologists like Piaget. So mm -hmm. for me, once I got a hold of that kind of intellectually, I gravitated towards Habermas and yeah. uh, because Habermas builds on uh, Piaget's work and Kolber's work uh, from a developmental psychology standpoint. Um, and so that's kind of where I ended up kind of intellectually. And then I start to bridge that in with my interest in religion and religious studies. But obviously, Michael went into the area of, of uh, international relations once he ended up going to, to university. And that's what he kind of did in terms of his formal studies before going into broadcasting or the type of career that he eventually developed. Um, I guess my question is, is that, I mean, he gravitated towards Marxist humanism and he was weaving in this aspect of it. And I guess if he was around, I would be asking him this same type of question. Why does the left not, not interested in these sorts of, uh, based approaches in a certain way? Uh, why do you think it's not as palpable, uh, with people on the left in terms of, uh, talking about this, this, I guess this school and this sort of philosophical orientation. You mean putting forward constructive alternatives to the status quo? Is that the idea? I, I guess in a certain way. Yeah. But I mean, the, well, this is the other thing too, is this from a critical legal studies standpoint for you, um, the capabilities based approach, is it an outgrowth of. I mean, and this is might be a really stupid question. Is it an outgrowth of natural law or how, oh. how do you, how do you actually view it in terms of, because I mean, within the social sciences, this is the interesting thing too, that I like about Habermas is that, I mean, he really zones in on the social sciences and then bridges into law. And I mean, I'm clueless on the law side of the street. So this is why I've been so interested by your work and stuff like that, because you've been filling in so many gaps for me. So I guess, where do you see the capabilities based approach as a school or as a philosophy fitting in into the larger kind of picture of a, a critical legal studies, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So one of the ways that I connected these two things was through somebody like Roberto Unger, right? Uh, because what Roberto Unger continuously stresses is that liberal legal systems tend to focus on the atomistic rights of individuals and what individuals need in order to secure a kind of zone on autonomy relative to one another and relative to the state. Now, Unger isn't saying that securing these classical liberal rights isn't an important historical accomplishment. Obviously it is, right? Uh, but he does think that it's limited in certain kinds of ways, right? Uh, and one of the ways that it's limited is in inhibiting people's capacity to change the world around them in order to better secure the conditions for their own flourishing, uh, to use what Unger calls their context transcending powers, right? And false necessity. Uh, now, Unger develops his own unique kind of approach to an alternative uh, to the contemporary liberal legal system uh, that we could talk about if you want. It's very interesting. And actually, I'm reviewing a new book of his that's coming out uh, in January, where it's, which is 600 pages, where he lays out his fresh perspective on things. So Unger's journey is not finished yet, uh, let alone the you know, same way as Habermas's, right? Uh, but from my, from my point of view, I integrated that with Sen uh, because I think that Sen's capabilities approach really puts a lot of meat on the bone of what it would mean to have context transforming powers. Uh, because people who are more capable in their individual life and in their interpersonal life uh, generally are also more capable of committing themselves to political and social enterprises, economic reforms, uh, and to further securing the conditions that they think are needed to not only retain what they already have that's necessary to their flourishing, but expand upon that further. Uh, so that's where the connection really became meaningful for me, at least early on, and certainly in this book. Uh, although, of course, I want to also stress my debt to people like Martha Nussbaum, uh, since Nussbaum brought a feminist angle into this as well, by stressing how being capable uh, is not just even a matter of what Sen is talking about, which is the kind of capabilities that you have as an individual. Uh, it's also being capable in terms of our interpersonal relations with one another, since of course, other people can facilitate our capabilities uh, in terms of the emotional relationships that we establish with them, in terms of the friendships that we might find meaningful that allow us to feel more confident about ourselves and then enable us to pursue projects that we wouldn't otherwise. Uh, and of course, in terms of our romantic relationships, which are absolutely vital uh, to 
securing not just the conditions for our flourishing, uh, but the conditions for us having a life of meaning. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, because I'm well, because I had Daniel Tut on my pod, and oh, Daniel's uh, great. Yeah, yeah, he's fantastic. I mean, his work is really kind of blown my mind as well. Um, oh, by and, the way, I should say uh, his Nietzsche book that's coming out soon. Have you read it? No, I haven't read it yet. Oh, it's so good. I mean, honestly, I've I blurbed it, so I'm biased, but like, uh, so so good, right? I really think it's going to shake things up an awful lot when it comes out. Um, because he really just lays out the first, I want to call it post Lacerdian take on Nietzsche from a left perspective. And he does it with a lot of grace, a lot of humor, and a lot of care. Uh, so, yeah, just I'm very excited to see where he goes in the oh, future. Oh, excellent. You know, and he said that, you know, once that comes out, if uh, he, he was in, I mean, he asked I, to come back on and if I read it afterwards and if I had any questions to reach out to him. So that would be cool to actually discuss that with him. But I, I was fascinated by this paper that he wrote in terms of the tension, particularly within the American context between pragmatism, American pragmatism and Marxism. And I guess is because I'm trying to situate Michael in a particular way, because Michael kind of straddled all these hats, right? I mean, he oh, yeah. was very interested in Cornell West's work. And I mean, Cornell is such a complicated figure as well. I mean, he's most of his work is actually on American pragmatism, but obviously he's a truly well-rounded and grounded Marxist as well, or fully informed in terms of the Marxist tradition and stuff like that. Um, and I guess what I, I want to go out and draw out of Daniel is, is this tension, I guess, uh, on the left, or particularly with Marxists, on, in terms of why won't they go and draw a bit more, I guess, on on pragmatism and this court, sort of capabilities-based approach to actually go out and develop some sort of new understanding of what the left can actually go out and be. And I feel that Daniel, you, and even uh, Matt Flissfetter, everybody that I've been reaching out to to actually go out and interview and stuff like that, are you guys are really pushing into a sort of new philosophical horizon to what the left can actually go out and be. And I mean, all these dimensions are in Michael as well, right? They're all there. They're all nascent. And his, his this book that you also wrote and the last book that he wrote is just a great launching, I think is a great launching off point for, for, for people to go out and for all of us, for people that are very interested in going out and the history of the left to actually go out and flesh out uh, all these various dimensions. So my, my question to you is, I guess, What's up with more Marxists? Because I mean, I've never even self-identified as a Marxist. I've always self-identified myself as a progressive and being on the left. And like, you know, I mean, I've gravitated towards Habermas and stuff like that. And he gets he gets smeared as a lib or it could be smeared as a lib. So I, I guess, what do you make of this tension between American pragmatism and Marxism? And, you know, and do you, did you see this as well a bit in obviously in Michael's work? Or were you thinking at any of that as you were writing this particular book on him? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. And I think there are tensions and overlaps between American pragmatism. You know, if we we're talking about the trajectory that runs from kind of uh, William James through Dewey and Peirce uh, to Richard Rorty, right, and Brandom, right? Uh, now, I think that there are... Two areas uh, where American pragmatism can overlap with Mark American with Marxism, and one area where there's almost invariably going to be a kind of tension. Right? Uh, one area. So the one area where American pragmatism can overlap with Marxism uh, is both share the ultimately Hegelian uh, insight that society is contingent and it is constructed right by human beings, and consequently should not be naturalized uh, in any kind of conservative way. Uh, and of course, what I mean by this is that human society isn't something that we are beholden to. Uh, it's something that has to serve human ends. And of course, there's been a wide variety of different Marxists who have continuously emphasized this. And it's always been something that has been central to American pragmatism, particularly post Dewey. So that's an area of conversational overlap where I think some interesting things could be said. Uh, and this is also something that I mentioned Unger uh, brings up in his book on American pragmatism, uh, where he also links this with a kind of Marxist spirit, right? Uh, this idea of overcoming false necessity and recognizing the contingency of the social world. Another area of overlap that's more technical, but I think just as important, uh, is, of course, American pragmatists and Marxists both share a deep genealogical link to Hegel uh, and Hegelianism, broadly speaking, right? Uh, and American pragmatism, as many people know, is currently going through this really transformative phase of Hegelianizing itself through the work of people like Robert Brandom, uh, who some of your writers might know. I wrote a review of his recent book uh, for uh, historical materialism. 
A kick ass review, by the way, is fantastic. I really love that paper. And I'm definitely going to link that in there as well, along with your latest paper too, on the experience of time and freedom within neoliberal postmodernity, by the way, both of those papers for me were like, boom, like I was, I loved it. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. But yeah, I mean, so I mean, that's just to say, like, whenever there is a genealogical figure that two traditions share in common, uh, like, you know, both American pragmatism and Marxism share Hegel, uh, there's points of constructive dialogue that can be engaged in. Uh, and I'd also add, I think Copper Moss does a great job with this, uh, especially in his early work, right? Uh, now, this is going to be inherently tricky, right? Because the American pragmatists will almost invariably say that the Marxists are not taking epistemological questions seriously enough uh, in their insistence that it is possible to know and transform the social world simultaneously, at least if they're in a particular orthodox mode. And the Marxists are almost invariably going to accuse American pragmatists of being crypto idealists uh, of some form or another, right? Uh, of reifying social institutions uh, and only being critical of them insofar as they are willing to apply a kind of utilitarian normative theory uh, to evaluate whether they're efficacious or not, right? Uh, but still, that's a point of dialogue that we could have. And I'd like to stress that I think Brandon also starts to begin this dialogue uh, in his latest book on Hegel, uh, where he takes some of Marx's objections seriously, tries to respond to them from a kind of a make American pragmatic Hegelian standpoint, uh, and opens up the door for a further debate on these questions, right? So where are we gonna go from here? It's hard to say, I don't know. Uh, but this leads me to where I think there will always be a perennial tension uh, between American pragmatism and Marxism, which is on the epistemological questions. Uh, because at the epicenter of American pragmatism is fundamentally a skepticism uh, about human knowledge, right? particularly in its post rorschian phases. Uh, now, Brandom isn't as much of a skeptic as Richard Rorty is, uh, but he does absolutely stress the notion that truth claims uh, are bound up within the semantic horizon of our world at any given time, and they need to be evaluated according to standards that are internal uh, to these semantic horizons, right? Uh, we can't kind of get outside uh, of our own semantics to adjudicate uh, the truth claims that we make within it from some kind of Archimedean standpoint. And Marxism, at least as it's been classically understood, presupposes that we should be able to do exactly that, right? If not under the conditions of capitalist ideology, at the very least with a transition to a socialist society where we are no longer inhabitants uh, of a kind of reified life world uh, and we're able to kind of face our social conditions clearly without any more ideological or hegemonic illusions, right? Uh, now, whatever one thinks of this, uh, I think that there are powerful threads underpinning this argument, uh, because I do think that it is possible to have a less ideologically determined life world than we have right now. And I think that anybody who wants to be committed to a critical theoretical project has to be committed uh, to at least some aspect of that, right? Uh, but of course, this runs in some ways quite counter to the project of American pragmatism, which is always gonna stress that this idea of kind of getting outside uh, of our Contemporary semantic horizon uh, is for whom getting outside our contemporary semantic horizon is always going to be an illusion, right? Uh, and you know this is also a point that Marx made against Hegel, right? Hegel famously said that the Owl of Minerva uh, only sounds at midnight. You know we can only know our own time and thought, nothing more. Uh, and Marx is going to insist that we need to know our own time and thought, yes, but we also need to know a little bit more in order to be able to change it. Uh, and that's a key point of dispute where I'm not sure. Um, how it can be reconciled, at least gotcha. right now. Gotcha, gotcha. No, I mean, because, uh, well, I mean, this is the other thing, too. I guess, you know, um, because Nancy Fraser and uh, Richard Bernstein have had a tremendous influence on me specifically, particularly Richard Bernstein, I'll say. In fact, Richard Bernstein was kind of my guide to actually go out and make sense of Habermas when people start just throwing that over my head. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, he, I mean, Richard Bernstein was a good friend of uh, Richard Rorty and stuff like that. So I really got into the whole sort of pragmatist school and stuff like that. So there is this sort of left leaning sort of pragmatist school that's out there that's obviously deeply informed by Marxism and socialism. And Nancy Fraser uh, is obviously a key point as well oh, yeah. obviously, and stuff like that. Um, but I, I feel this tension and I'm going to throw this out there, sort of the new sort of millennial left, particularly people that are gravitating around Jacobin and stuff like that, that 
And I understand in a certain way, this is the, I guess my other question to you is that because the millennial left or the people that usually gravitate around um, a Jacobin, um, I mean, are obviously quite hostile and for due reason, I think, to third way politics, right? Or third way sort of, uh, uh, you know, that whole school of, of political a philosophy that eventually came out. And I guess maybe do you, you think that's maybe one of the reasons why, I mean, people are really kind of pushed off the sort of pragmatist orientation is, is that it's too close to third way politics. I think so. Yes. And I mean, there's no denying that a wide array of figures like Richard Rorty, right. Um, moderated themselves in response to things like the fall of the Soviet Union and the collapse of real existing socialism and kind of suggested that the best that we can do is try to reform from within contemporary liberal capitalist societies rather than engage in any wholesale structural transformations, right? Uh, I mean, Rorty's entire theory, especially in his late work, was this idea that we should just make liberal capitalist society less cruel, right, and more humane. Uh, now, of course, I tend to sympathize with that, and I would like a less cruel and more humane capitalism, but I think that we can do a little bit better than that. But I think that ultimately, to your question, the motivation behind a lot of this is less theoretical and more generational, um, since you talked about the kind of millennial left, because a lot of millennials grew up during the end of history period where there was a consistent insistence that there was no alternative but to the status quo. The best thing that one could do is tinker around the edges with it. And within that context, third way politics that tries to humanize or soften capitalism is really the best that we can do, right? Uh, then the 2008 recession happened, the war on terror happened, uh, now the COVID pandemic happened and we saw what happened once more, right? Where plenty of politicians around the world started to argue that human beings need to sacrifice for themse themselves to the economy rather than vice versa. Uh, and it really reignited this desire for a more substantive kind of politics that postulated radical alternatives to the status quo, uh, while at the same time acknowledging that various kinds of socialist projects in the past had either failed spectacularly and is in the Soviet Union, uh, or been actually quite successful. If we think about the kind of Nordic experiments with the Mitre plan, Mitre plan uh, but it kind of run their course uh, and didn't look like they had much of a future ahead of them. Uh, so I can empathize with a lot of this, right? Uh, I almost I, I almost want to kind of appeal to Sam Moyne here uh, and say that sitting there and just putting forward third way politics uh, as the best alternative that we have is simply not enough, right? Uh, to satisfy this urge for something better uh, that can inspire. Uh, but, you know, to your more complex point, I don't think that that should preclude us from drawing very substantial insights from traditions like American pragmatism, let alone Habermasianism, uh, or the entire tradition of third and fourth generation Frankfurt School critical theory that itself draws very heavily from the pragmatic tradition, so long as we are aware that we need to kind of sharpen their radical blades a little bit uh, in order to advance the more militant alternatives that we want to see. Oh, totally, for sure. Yeah. No, and I mean, in uh, obviously everything to uh, post 2008 is, I mean, Marx is, uh, I mean, Marx was always there, the left was always there. But obviously, I think it came back in a way, uh, oh, yeah. way more, uh, you know, on a stronger footing, uh, you know, and it just came back with a, a whiplash that never really be seen for a long time. So and I can see why millennials uh, really got kind of dove in and, in, in, you know, bite their teeth into it in a particular way. And this is the interesting thing too about Michael. I mean, I'm a bit older than Michael, but I mean, uh, like I'm an old, oh, a young, <laughs> like I'm born in 77. So, okay. uh, like I, I'm a right on, Gen Xer. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I'm right on that cusp. So in a certain way, I kind of actually feel more like a millennial than I do a Gen X, but, uh, sitting down actually with Doug Lane, I had a bit of a chuckle in terms of that because he's, <laughs> he's was way more of a Marxist and way more radical than I ever was throughout the eighties and nineties and stuff like that. And moving into the two thousands. Uh, so I, you know, and, and I think, Michael needs to be sort of historically held in that sort of a context to go and complexify who he was uh, and who you are as well, right? As you're coming of age and more of age now, I mean, you're full-fledged almost, you know, professor and public intellectual now in a certain way as well, which is just amazing to go out and, and witness and see that happen as well. And guys like Burgess too. Um, so it, I guess we can dive into the book. I mean, because I feel like 
use the book as a bit of a jumping off point. And I think if Michael was around, I really think, well, you and Burgess and Michael would have really gone toe to toe and really duped yeah. it out. I think you guys would have really duped it out. Uh, and um, cause you, I mean, throughout the whole book, I felt that kind of like, eh, yeah, like I little, this cosmopolitan socialism thing is good, but I'm not too sure about it. It's it it's got a lot of baggage. So maybe we can kind of just kind of talk a bit about this sort of the cosmopolitan baggage that you really lay out in the book itself, um, and some some of your hesitations around uh, the cosmopolitan turn and and socialism as well. I guess a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to say I think that Michael was deeply concerned about the same kinds of things, right? Yeah. Uh, so. Part of the problem that he stressed about cosmopolitanism is that it can very easily turn in a kind into a kind of chauvinistic universalism, right? Uh, this notion that there's one right way for the world to be ordered, there's one right way for every society to be organized, and the thing that we should be trying to do as good cosmopolitans is to enact this kind of global program. Uh, as sweepingly and as comprehensively as we possibly can, right? Uh, even up to and including establishing a one world government that will face all human differences and establish just institutions from the top down, you know, in some mega city, right? Uh, and Michael obviously had no truck with something like that because he was a real admirer of human diversity, the variety of cultures out there, the insights that one could find, especially in a variety of religious traditions. Uh, and he would have thought that, this idea that one should simply impose a pattern uh, of justice on any given community without any respect for its particularities or history uh, would have been a monstrous kind of thing to do. And I absolutely sympathize with this, right? But Michael also stressed that there was another kind of cosmopolitanism, which is the one that I adhere to, right? Uh, and this was the kind of cosmopolitanism that one originally saw, for instance, in ancient Greece, right, uh, which held that nothing human will be foreign to me, right, uh, that I will recognize myself and others and others in me uh, and understand that what is important to these people is something that I can learn from benefit from, uh, and that might actually enrich my life in a certain kind of way. Uh, and this is, of course, the attitude that he took towards everything uh, with his interest in Buddhism and his interest in Latin American politics, uh, with his interest, of course, in integral theory, uh, with his fascination with figures like Cornell West uh, and black militancy in the United States. For Michael, nothing human was foreign to him. Right. He really kind of empathized with people, especially the least well off wherever they happen to be. Uh, and that's the kind of attitude or disposition that I tried to bring to bear when I was articulating my own arguments for cosmopolitan socialism. Right? Now, the socialism aspect of this is also troublesome, uh, but I think vital, because as we know, socialism can have has had a very storied and colorful history, right? Uh, again, it's seen impressive successes in places like the Nordic countries or like Brazil for that matter. Uh, and it's also seen some calamities in countries like the Soviet Union or China. Uh, but one of the things that Michael, that Michael was always impressed by when it came to the socialist tradition was this deep concern uh, for the little guy in society, wherever he happened to be, right? Uh, this almost Christian sense that the least well off uh, should be the primary subjects of our attention, right? Uh, or your society can only be evaluated as good or just to the extent it looks after the least among us, right? Uh, and I think what he was responsive to also in socialist universalism was this idea that we need to be attentive and concerned about people who are suffering, regardless uh, of whether they belong to our so-called ethnic community or not, right? Uh, that what's going on in Brazil when farmers are being driven out of their homesteads uh, or what's going on in Mexico, right? Uh, where the United States is decimating uh, the corn producing industries in order to make way for its own producers. That's something that we need to care about, right? Uh, it's not foreign to us in some way, shape or form. But Michael was also deeply concerned uh, about the kinds of leftism that can internalize a lot of these imperialist forms of universalism. Uh, and of course, we can look throughout history and see that show that socialists generally have never been immunized from those kinds of temptations either. So it's a difficult thread to needle, but I definitely don't think it's impossible. And what I think Michael's work showed and what my book shows is that we can get better at threading that needle if we work at it. 
Oh, for sure. No, I, I mean, I guess that this is what I'm trying to get at or put my finger on is that you're both really threading the needle uh, in both of your works. I mean, if I read Against the Web and I mean, obviously your book now and even the work that you've been doing or trying to work towards in terms of a, uh, a liberal socialism, your, your new work on liberal socialism, that I feel that's been bubbling underneath all your work for the last <laughs> God, long, long time. So I figure oh, yeah. I, I'm really excited to go out and see that book as well. Um, but this is it, it sort of what you beautifully go out and talk about too, right? In all of your work is that the, the, the postmodern condition uh, has gone out and relativized and deconstructed everything. So we're just kind of left in a sort of ruin, it, ruin uh, of everything in terms of all of our traditions right but in that ruin there's also so much great potential for new things to actually go out and emerge and i mean you're both just as hard on liberalism socialism and communism in a certain way uh like i know you're straddling the liberal sort of socialist bent but michael seemed to have really wrestled as well in terms of his i guess the way he got exposed to marxism and marxist humanism and um because you've been you know i know you've you kind of written a bit, well, not written about, I've heard you talk a bit in terms of how From has, has gone out and had a, an impact on you and stuff like that. No, From yeah, has no had a, a great impact on me. So I guess, um, I guess, how, why aren't you guys gravitating towards uh, a sort of Marxist humanism instead of actually all these other terms? I'm just kind of curious, because uh, I, I would have pressured Michael to go and kind of <laughs> pushed back on him. Why aren't you moving towards humanism? And this was the upshot as well with my conversation with Matt Flissfetter, right? Because Matt Flissfetter is talking about a new structuralism and new humanism that he's trying to go and articulate in all of his work. And I have to yeah. be honest, uh, I'm leaning a lot in that direction. I feel, uh, uh, I feel his argument is, is a little more dead on to all these other terms that we might be bouncing around, particularly on the left. So I'm kind of curious to hear a bit, you flesh out the Marxist humanism stuff a bit. Well, I should say that Matt's a brilliant guy, right? Uh, and I'm very excited to see what he cooks up uh, in those respects. And, you know, I have no doubt that it'd be expansively interesting, right? Uh, and I also want to say that I'm not hostile to Marxist humanism. In fact, I have uh, an essay coming out in a new collection called Flowers for Marx, not too long from now, where I defend Marxist humanism, right? Uh, now, the reason I characterize myself as a liberal socialist, though, is I think that a properly understood Marxist humanism is very attentive to the benefits that we can get from certain kinds of liberal institutions, right? And this is something that I point out following Igor Schuchat-Brock, that Marx himself seemed to have sympathized with. Uh, you know, Marx advocated for historical change, yes, uh, but he said that in any transition to socialism, the society that replaces bourgeois society will be stamped with many of the features from the old society. And one should hope that the features that the new society will be stamped by will be the things that are most valuable in the liberal tradition. So that, I mean, that includes things like rights to participate in political participation, right? Uh, particularly the rights to vote and to run for office, protection for religious minorities and other kinds of minorities, rights to freedom of expression, rights to freedom of the press, uh, absolutely rights to personal liberty and autonomy, right? Uh, but less so rights to private property, right? Uh, by which I mean not personal property, but private ownership of the means of production, right? Uh, and these are all aspects of the liberal tradition that I think are very worth keeping on to. Uh, and I would argue that one of the reasons for the failure uh, of Marxist regimes like the Soviet Union uh, was precisely that they threw away uh, some of the core liberal institutions that would have been necessary uh, to sustain the kind of transformative projects that they were aiming at and legitimating them in the eyes of the world. So I, my new book, The Political Theory of Liberal Socialism, uh, traces the evolution of this political theory from the writings of people like Thomas Paine, Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, through the first liberal socialist, according to me at least, John Stuart Mill uh, and John Rawls. But there's a long chapter uh, on Marx where I point out that there's nothing that's irreconcilable between Marxist humanism uh, and liberal socialism, so long as one appreciates uh, that a Marxist theory uh, without a kind of normative commitment to liberal justice is not one that we should get behind. Uh, but a liberal theory that is focused on 
justice uh, that is not complemented by a Marxist theory of power is really a pretty impotent thing. So I'd say that the two need each other uh, very, very badly. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, well, I because mean, the other thing too is, I guess, because which you beautifully lay out in all your work in terms of postmodern conservatism, when you talk about the postmodern condition, there's been this deep nostalgia within postmodernism, right, where people are desperately grasping for roots. And the question of identity obviously comes up quite a bit as well. Um, I personally think, I mean, as somebody who's a bit older, I'm kind of watching millennials kind of go out and really struggle, I think, with this idea of roots and this idea of identity formation. Uh, I think there's a sort of psychological dimension that can go out and be explored quite a bit uh, to that as well. Um, but you obviously talk about, obviously as a political theorist, I mean, I'm not a political theorist. I mean, you talk about nationalism, right? Well, how postmodern conservatism all of a sudden is, 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 is rebirth this idea of nationalism. Um, and, but there's also in some corners, uh, people that are gravitating back towards communism. Um, and so I guess my, I guess. For me, this is another reason, or even I guess in terms of my conversation with Matt is that, or even my conversation with Daniel is that, you know, like when people start pushing communism to me, I just go, I'm a humanist. I mean, I just, <laughs> I just can't, I just can't go there in a certain way. Um, so I was kind of curious to go and get a bit of a, 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 I guess your take in terms of what's going on there within the postmodern condition in terms of this return to nationalism. Uh, and there's also this return to uh, sort of ethno nationalism, but also this return to civilizational sort of empire building as well, uh, which is deeply problematic. So I'm kind of curious to, to get your take in terms of as, if those things do arise, um, how, how do you feel? Or, I mean, I guess I'm trying to push you towards humanism, I guess, in a certain way, but I'm just curious to hear, I guess, some of your thoughts on that a bit. Well, I don't think it's a surprise at all that under postmodern conditions, we see people turning back to nationalism, right, uh, as a source of identity. And as you pointed out, I've talked a great deal about this uh, in all my books on postmodernity, because once one sees the sources of the self, to use Charles Taylor's term, dissolved under intense pressures from liberalism, capitalism, and secularism, uh, then people are left with a kind of deracinated sense of selfhood that they'll be willing to fill with almost anything that happens to be available. Uh, but what I stress, of course, in my books on postmodernity is that the kinds of nationalism uh, that people identify with right now aren't the kinds of nationalism that one would see in the 19th or even the 20th century. They have these distinctly postmodern qualities to them, uh, where people will almost stitch their sense of what the nation is supposed to be together from a bricolage uh, of different available cultural signifiers. Um, this is especially true in online environments, but it doesn't have to be if we think about the way that urbanism, for example, uh, very much kind of drew selectively from wide aspects of Hungarian history to try to create an idea of the Hungarian nationalist that was appropriate for a uniparty state that'd be ruled by Fidesz, right? Uh, or we think about people like George Maloney, right, uh, with her trying to reconceptualize uh, what it would mean to be fascist in the 21st century uh, by simultaneously warning down the authoritarian and misogynistic dimensions of that uh, while upping um, various aspects of the ultranational uh, underpinnings of fascism, right? Uh, so it's not a surprise that many people would turn to this right now. And I also don't think it's a real surprise that people would turn to something like communism. And I think that people like Alain Bidjia and Slavoj Žižek have articulated the motivations behind this very nicely uh, in big essay collections like the idea of communism. Because under the conditions of postmodernity, where people are yearning for an identity, uh, while nationalism can be extremely appealing, so can, can the kind of universalistic aspirations that communism once posited, right? Uh, and communism has a special kind of appeal precisely for the same reasons that it did in the 20th century, right? Uh, where communism can integrate in itself uh, both this religious yearning for transcendence uh, and the overcoming of 
all systematic forms of injustice with the kind of scientific ethos of being rational, realistic, uh, and understanding the world as it is without being occluded by illusions, right? Uh, now, one might think that these two different ways of looking at things, a kind of religious yearning for a transcendence uh, and a scientific desire to be rational would be entirely incompatible with one another. Uh, but one of the things that Orthodox Marxism did very successfully was integrate these two together, right? Into what seemed like a very seamless narrative for a long period of time. Now, of course, this was profoundly undermined uh, by the collapse of Soviet communism, right? Uh, and of course, you know, the transition of Chinese communism uh, towards, you know, what it is right now. Uh, but I don't think that the yearning for an ideology that can do both of these things at the same time has ever completely disappeared, uh, especially one that has the kind of universal pretensions that communism did. Uh, and Consequently, it's not surprising that many people are turning to it again. Uh, now, I have some sympathy with this ambition, as you know, uh, but I am not a communist. I'm a liberal democratic socialist. Uh, and the reason for this distinction uh, is I don't believe either in the kind of Marxist-Leninist call uh, for a vanguard party to seize control of the state and establish an authoritarian regime, uh, or the kind of anarcho-communist call to dissolve the state uh, and replace it with a utopian lawless society. I don't think either of those are attractive or viable for a huge variety of different reasons that I don't think we want to get into right now. Right? No, so, for sure. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I guess, because this is kind of my fear, I guess, in terms of when I start to hear some of this stuff, is that state theory in a certain way is being pushed to the side. I mean, I'm against nationalism as well, but I think that the left really needs to go and weave in or uh, integrate uh, some rigorous sort of state theory type stuff. And I mean, the cool thing about, I mean, I kind of shared with you on Twitter that I'm actually reading Habermas's new book. And oh, yeah. I mean, how is it by the way? Oh, dude, I'm floored. I'm floored. And I, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, and it plays into this. Um, he complexifies the idea of cosmopolitanism and internationalism. And he's talking about um, oh, this is the other thing too that I want to talk to you a bit about. Like he's weaving in Robert Bella's work in terms of um, his work on the, um, uh, uh, I guess, civilizational um, theories and civil uh, the modernization of civilizations because of his background in religious mm -hmm. studies and stuff like that. So he's building on that, and obviously Jasper's in terms of the axial age type work as well. So he's he's evolved that and he's moving into an interesting kind of direction along with that. Um, but I guess is within these civilizational blocks, uh, like a few times I've like, like kind of in the past, like I, I kind of poked you a bit on the Huntington thing. Um, and whether you think there's any truth to that, or if those particular structures, if we say that basically that the, the state or nationalism is a particular structure that is necessary for human flourishing to a certain way as, as long as it's going to actually go out and remain healthy, do civilizational blocks, uh, things like the Anglosphere or, you know, uh, sort of other civilizational blocks and stuff like that, can they go out and be, um, can they develop and flourish in a healthy manner? And instead of a clash of civilization, could we actually be talking about a sort of dialogue of civilizations? And if that's a, a possibility uh, for what you were thinking about in terms of cosmopolitanism, uh, because I would have loved to kind of poke Mike on that. I feel that he would be very open to that kind of discourse and stuff like that. He seems to be weaving in very sophisticated ideas of what the future of cosmopolitanism looks like. So I was kind of curious to get your take on that too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the problems that a lot of people have with Huntington's typology uh, were that he historically essentialized huge groups of people, uh, many of whom had profound differences uh, that existed between them, right? Uh, if you think about the profound linguistic and cultural and regional differences between so-called Western states, right? Um, and also that he also seemed to rely on some very tenuous uh, kinds of racialized assumptions uh, about other kinds of differences that it took to exist between different kinds of civilization, right? Uh, and a very good example of this that was consistently brought up is the fact that he makes an analytical distinction between Western civilization uh, and kind of Latin civilization, right? Uh, and people pointed out, if you think about Latin America, right, uh, Latin America is 
you know, a Spanish speaking or Portuguese speaking region uh, is predominantly Christian. For the most part, those states have democratic forms of government, right? Uh, and some of these countries are actually increasingly very, very rich, right? Uh, if you think about a state like Chile, for example, right? Uh, or even Argentina until very recently. Uh, so the only reason why he's decided that, he seems to have decided that this region doesn't belong to the Western world is because those groups of people just have less melanin uh, in their skin than they would need to be part of the club per se, right? And I'm sympathetic to all those kinds of criticisms, right? On the broader question though, of whether or not there are large scale differences between large groups of people. Uh, there, I think that clearly there are some, right? Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily mince it in civilizational terms, uh, but I would argue that if you look at the difference between say, Roman Catholicism, right, uh, and Eastern Orthodoxy, which pertain to billions of people around the globe, uh, or the differences between democratic forms of government and authoritarian forms of government, that's also another meaningful distinction that we can make, right? Uh, and whether or not we can have dialogues between people of different faiths or people who have very different convictions about the kind of political ideologies that are appropriate, I think that we can, but I think it requires a capacity to think in idioms that we aren't inherently familiar with. Uh, so a good example of this would be just what like Taylor talks about when it comes to having religious disagreements, right? Uh, it can be very easy when one is having a religious dialogue with another person to want to translate the ideas of one faith tradition into the conceptual vocabulary of your own faith tradition and to say, oh, what you believe is essentially just what I believe, except these are your terms and your symbols for making sense of that. And these are my terms and my symbols for making sense of that, right? And now, sometimes that is true, and it can be a helpful exercise, but it can also be reductive, right, uh, and homologizing. Uh, and it doesn't allow us to appreciate the real theological subtleties that make a faith tradition different from every other faith tradition. Uh, so, what one needs to do in these kinds of circumstances isn't to try to translate the idioms and symbols of one faith tradition into my faith tradition, but to actually try to understand the internal way that people within that faith tradition understand their own symbology and their own uh, religion. And I think that is an extremely difficult thing to do, but it is definitely a possible thing to do, right? Um, so for instance, I think Somebody like Paul Tillich, who I've written about, right, uh, was quite successful uh, in dialoguing with members of Jewish faith tradition, right, uh, and sometimes taking an interest in Eastern Orthodox faith. Even if he didn't always hit the nail on the head, uh, there were serious efforts made by one of the great theologi Christian theologians of our time uh, to engage in sincere interfaith dialogue, right? Uh, or we can talk about the dialogue that took place between Jürgen Habermas uh, and the late Pope Ratzinger. Yeah, then Bishop Rathenser, right? Um, that was a very interesting discourse, precisely because we have not two faith traditions, uh, but somebody who is the kind of embodiment of a secular humanism uh, and has long defended that in his work, uh, and somebody who embodies the ethos of a kind of conservative Catholicism. Uh, and they dialogued with one another, I think, quite successfully without reducing uh, one or the other's traditions, traditions to one another. So with... The proper disposition, a huge amount of time, uh, and real care committed, the kind of interpersonal and intergroup dialogues that you want to see occur can occur. I just don't know that many people are willing to assume the responsibility that's required in order to do that successfully. No, for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, it, well, because I mean, with my background in religious studies, I mean, that those particular models came to the fore, particularly since I like, I gravitated towards Robert Bella. But eventually, I discovered uh, Fred Dal uh, Dalmer, I guess is his last name, who's up at the University of Notre Dame as well. And he's the one that eventually started to write about this idea of rather than a clash of civilizations, we should be talking about a dialogue of civilizations. And yeah. he builds on Habermas's idea of communicative action and stuff like that as a, as a, as a means or a method uh, that this kind of happens over the course of time and stuff like that. It's not something that's, you know, is, is ever resolved. It's always kind of tecto these tectonic plates kind of always on the move that are always in, you know, in, 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 in permanent change. Um, well, if, if I could just add one thing, I think Daniel Allen contributes uh, an awful lot to how we need to understand these in a particularly creative way. So, and her book, Talking to Strangers, 
Allen develops a critique of communicative action that's sympathetic uh, to its broad ambitions, but critical of its methodology. So one of the things that she points out is that central to the ethos of communicative action is this notion of communicative rationality, right? That dialoguing with one another with the ambition of engaging in a kind of praxis requires us to engage in reason giving activities and reason giving uh, forms of speech acts right uh, and of course she says that's absolutely essential right to dialoguing with someone in a meaningful way but there's also an emotional and affective basis to this that's extraordinarily important that she points out Habermas does not pay nearly sufficient attention to uh, and one of the examples that she gives to try to ground this is the experience of mixed race communities in the American South uh, when the Jim Crow laws uh, were kind of collapsing everywhere in the aftermath of the Brown v. Board of Education decision. Uh, so she points out that in these kind of circumstances, you have white communities and black communities come together that were extraordinarily suspicious of one another, right? Uh, because of a long history of white supremacy, many whites felt that they were entitled to more or less exercise dominance uh, over blacks, however it is that they wanted. Uh, and if they weren't going to exercise dominance, then they wanted nothing to do with them, right? Uh, and many blacks were very understandably deeply anxious about going and interacting with whites, uh, considering the long history of persecution that they had undergone. But she says what eventually helped make things better uh, wasn't just reason giving communicative uh, scenarios, right? It wasn't uh, that people eventually reached a situation where they engaged in ideal speech acts. It's the fact that people demonstrated that they were trustworthy uh, through actions and through being loyal to one another and through demonstrating affection to one another. Uh, and an example she gives, of course, is that many white teachers went to go teach black students in the American South, even though they were gonna face serious uh, persecution and social stigma from within their own community, right? Uh, and of course, many black parents heroically were willing to send their children uh, to a school with white teachers, uh, knowing that it was gonna be really rough. It was gonna be really tough. Uh, and both students and teachers appreciated one another for being willing to make that sacrifice and take the steps that are needed to achieve integration in the community. And it's that level of effective integration uh, that Alan says is absolutely crucial if you're going to actually build towards a scenario where you can dialogue with one another in a reason giving way. And I'm very sympathetic to that. Oh, totally. No, for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, because and Habermas's communicative uh, action theory is is super dry. I mean, the speech yeah. act stuff, like you said, is is just like like ripping. It's like w watching paint dry. I mean, anybody that has to, like I slug through it just because I had to go and slug through it. But I understand from uh, even from a more sort of psychological type dimension, like I understand why people are gravitating towards people like Zizek and his whole background in Lacanian theory because uh, I mean it, it just adds a certain complexity to to human life and uh, dialogue in, in a sophisticated way. I have a real tough time with Zizek in terms of his ongoing <laughs> stuff. Like, let's go back to Hegel though. Like to me, that seems a bit far-fetched. That seems to be like the equivalent of what you describe on the right in terms of postmodern conservatism's desperate, nostalgic searching around and turning everything over for some sort of roots seems to be a bit kind of what uh, Zizek did, right, is that Marxism kind of came to some sort of, well, it came to a horrible end in a certain way, and then basically we need to go back and re revision and re-pick re up our roots in a certain way. Uh, so, and this is the thing, though, I guess from integral theory as well, is that this is why I loved your work in terms of postmodern conservatism, because within integral theory is that there's this idea of the postmodern left, and the postmodern left is just as regressive and as... <laughs> Uh, stuck in a sort of identity politics and militant particularism as the way you like to go and describe it as the right. I mean, to me, the right now in terms of the new postmodern conservatism is, is it's just another form of militant <laughs> particularism and it's obsessed with identity and it's just as regressive and stupid. I mean, it's horrible. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is one of the things that Michael was very critical of as well, right? With yeah. good reason. Uh, now, I think we have to be very careful here because as Michael consistently pointed out very rightly, 
the socialist left has had a long problem of subordinating or ignoring or even tri trivializing the struggle of women for equality, people of color for equality, LGBTQ communities for equality, usually by suggesting uh, in some mysterious way that with the overcoming of class society, all of these other struggles would be resolved as well, right? And this includes admirable figures, right? People like Eugene Debs in the United States, uh, who was continuously pressed uh, by many of his friends and allies to take racial subordination more seriously uh, and just never really felt inspired to. Uh, when he was asked about these questions, he would say, of course, what I'm trying to do is intended to benefit blacks as well, right? Uh, but they're going to benefit by the transition to a socialist society. So that's what we need to dedicate all of our energy towards, right? And one shouldn't be surprised in those circumstances to see many people of color, women, uh, and LGBTQ persons be wary uh, of democratic socialism uh, and concerned that democratic socialists or liberal socialists aren't actually interested in advocating uh, for for their emancipation uh, and for their flourishing, right? Now, the other side to this though, of course, uh, is that it is very easy for these identity movements to become co-opted uh, within the structures of neoliberal capitalism. And I think Wendy Brown, for example, has just done extraordinary work about this, right? Uh, and we've seen that consistently time and time again, right? How Starbucks or Pepsi uh, or, virtually any big company, uh, tech company that you could think of, right, Facebook, uh, can adopt the language of woke identity politics quite successfully uh, and insinuate through their praxis that really what we shouldn't be concerned about is class domination at all. Uh, what we should aspire to is just to have a rainbow colored ruling class, right, where everybody, regardless of what identity category they might happen to fall into can rise to the top, but there always will be a top, right, uh, and a bottom, and we just need to learn to accept that. Uh, and in those kind of circumstances, naturally, I'm very sympathetic to the Marxist critique uh, that we need to take class domination seriously. Uh, and I'm even willing to be a little bit pronounced and say that class domination is extremely universal uh, in terms of its impact. So it might need to be the primary site of struggle, uh, not in the way that Eugene Debs understood it, but in terms of the kinds of political priorities uh, that we assume in the 21st century, right? Uh, especially when we think about the kind of impact that our contemporary economic system is having on the environment. Uh, and, you know, you pointed out it's 30 degrees in Montreal right now, right, in October. Uh, you know, the urgency to do something about that is becoming only ever more pressing, right? Uh, now, my thoughts on this aren't fully developed uh, because, like Michael, I'm deeply concerned uh, about any effort to kind of prioritize one of these struggles over the other in the way that I just insinuated, even though I do think the struggle against capital is so central. Uh, I think that somebody though, who's doing fantastic work of showing how we can model such an integration successfully uh, as an individual you mentioned before, Nancy Fraser, right? Especially in a book, Cannibal Capitalism, uh, because this book in particular shows how in many ways, struggles for women's equality feed into anti-capitalist struggles, uh, how the struggle against neoliberal capitalism inherently has a anti-imperialist and anti-colonial dimension, and the list goes on, right? So I think that people are getting better uh, at addressing these questions than they have in the past, both theoretically and politically, if you think about you know, the importance of the squad right, uh, in the United States. But I don't think that we're quite there yet. I think we have a ways to go. No, for sure. No, and I mean, that was the, Michael's genius as well in terms of, uh, like, obviously you can see, and he was annoyed with this, you know, the militant particularism and, and some of the squabbles that would happen around identity politics and like that. But he had a way to actually go out and elevate it. And I mean, if it wasn't for you and for him, I was falling into that sort of just frustration and reactionary sort of stance. Uh, like I left university, man, and I wanted nothing to do with it ever again, man, once I was out of there. To, and then to go and see that spill over in terms of the larger culture and then, you know, and, and infect the culture wars on such a large scale, I was like, oh my God, like, like this is wild. And I was kind of gravitating naturally towards the right just because I was getting frustrated with what was going on. I just felt there was no way out. We were turning around in circles all the time until I gravitated on your work and Michael's work and you guys calmed me down. 
Oh yeah, I mean, look, and help very- help me think through so many things, and and force me to go back and start to reevaluate even my sort of progressive, you know, uh, values in terms of where I was coming from. You know, not don't let go of them. Just reinterrogate all these questions all over again. Oh yeah, and you know, Michael put this very brilliantly, right? Where he said, "If you're an angry, dispossessed, poor person, uh, and you're trying to search out." A political identity for yourself uh, and you think well what does the left have to offer me uh, and you work your way through the internet and you come across a Robin D'Angelo book right uh, and you find out that the most important thing that you can do is police every element of part of your language as closely as possible uh, and pay through the roof uh, for DEI, DEI seminars then of course that's going to become really unappealing extremely quickly right uh, because this isn't really about profound structural transformation or bringing about a just world. It's really about a kind of management of people's guilt complexes uh, under the conditions of neoliberal sociality. And I don't want anything to do with that either, right? Uh, but I don't think that we should throw out the baby with the bathwater and just say uh, and say that just because some grifters like Robin D'Angelo have been able to profit uh, excessively through the adoption of this kind of woke rhetoric, uh, that you know the struggles for racial equality, gender equality, LGBT equality are somehow to be trivialized uh, or not important. I think they're absolutely central, right? And I do think that politicians like the members of the squad, for example, have been a lot more successful in finding a way how to integrate uh, the various moral concerns and political concerns of the left together in a way that no other politicians in my lifetime uh, have been capable of doing. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, or even worse. I mean, let guys like Peterson, burnt out professors that just got burnt out in universities that become neo reactionaries. I mean, that's essentially what how I look at it. It looks like he was a clinical psychologist that burnt out and a professor that burnt out and just lost his shit in, in, in higher ed because his students were challenging him on all kinds of stuff. And he's just an old curmudgeon. I mean, and he weaponized it to to make a shitload of money. I mean, the, that, that's... Oh, yeah. I mean, he even said that in, uh, what was his Joe Rogan interview, right? He's like, I've managed to weaponize anger at world culture to make an awful lot of money and feel very successful. And, you know, he sure has done that. Yeah. No, no. And guys like James Lindsay as well, that they've totally gone out and weaponized it against... And it's just counterproductive and it's just fueling the, the, the culture wars even more. Um, but... Listen, I mean, we're coming up to our time. I mean, like usual, I mean, you've been really gracious with your time. Um, uh, I see that you have another book, actually, <laughs> already out as well. Uh, Against Post-Liberal Courts and Justice, Rescuing <laughs> Ronald Dorkin, which is coming out this year as well. This is with... Uh, uh, no, that's coming out in uh, January, actually. So this is another book that actually goes back a ways. So it's pretty personal to me. Actually, you're the first person who's talked to me about this. So... Leslie Jacobs uh, was my supervisor during my PhD program, Uh, and he and I shared a deep enthusiasm for the legal theory of Ronald Dworkin, Uh, but I never really wrote all that much about it, uh, whether in, you know, my PhD thesis or my book on international law, mostly because Dworkin just doesn't talk very much about international law, one paper aside, right? Uh, but during the pandemic, he just reached out to me and was like, hey, you know, you were always interested in Dworkin. I am always been interested in Dworkin. Why don't we just write this thing together and you can throw in some of the stuff about post-liberalism that you're always fixated on. And I was like, yeah, OK, why Why not? Let's do it. Right. So um, this is a short little book. It's only about 110 pages, 120 pages that just reintroduces Dworkin to a legal community and talks about the kind of conceptual resources that he offers to progressive lawyers and progressive judges to try to combat the spread of reaction in that particular field. And oh, I think it's quite a good little book, you know. Cool. No, I mean, and, I mean, this connection that you have with Pal Grave, man, has been quite productive. I mean, and hats off, man. You've been weaving in, uh, I mean, you've been roping in people and to go and do compilation of essays as well. I mean, good for you, man. That's amazing work. I'm so, I mean, I, I hope I want I keep saying this too every time I interview you I want to see you come back in Canada I want you to get a job <laughs> in Canada I don't want to lose you permanently to the US I think it would be a real shame man so um, well you know I'll do the shameless grifter thing and say you know if any <laughs> Canadian universities are listening right uh I am definitely open for a tenure track position if you have one so get in touch you know you have my email 
Super. Well, man, again, I really appreciate your time and I hope you have a blast in Mexico. And uh, if it's anything like some of the other trips I heard you had, or particularly with Burgess in Mexico, I hope you come back alive, okay, but Just come back alive. <laughs> I will. I'll survive. You know, I'll survive worse than uh, a Mexican wedding. Uh, but yeah, it's great talking to you, buddy. And uh, I'm sure we'll chat again so- sometime soon. And keep on plugging away. It sounds to me like you've got some really interesting people in the pipeline that you've been talking to. 